So we are very happy to have with us today Conrad Swanepoel. And uh, Conrad is a discrete geometer based in the London School of Economics. Uh, he's uh, studying a very wide variety of problems. And today he'll tell us about matchstick graphs and penny graphs. And I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Thank you very much. So this is a joint work with uh, Jeremy Labolet. He was a BSc student at LSE, so he did some of this. We started working as part of his BSc dissertation. And then when that was done, he just continued. So he, he was sort of the energy behind a lot of this work, because I, I, I doubt that I would have continued with this just on my own. <clears throat> OK, so I have to apologize. This is very much uh, recreational sort of mathematics. But I will I will hint that there's some sort of an application at at some stage I will mention it. Um, so I will start off with penny graphs. Then I will look at matchstick graphs, different topics there. Oops, uh, I don't know what happened there. It was a big jump. Let me try again. Uh, oh yeah, so these these are links. I shouldn't touch <clears throat> this the my screen. Okay, so I will look. I will talk about uh, different things about matchstick graphs. Um, Adam specifically asked me not to just talk about what I proved, um, but I will also talk about what we proved, like here. And then I hope that there will be enough time for talking about some open problems, uh, especially the, the the open topic will be what happens if these graphs don't have triangles. So let me start off with penny graphs. Um, <clears throat> so a penny graph is just the contact graph of a packing of unit circles. So there you see a packing of unit circles. It's American money. Uh, this is because I took it from Wikipedia. Uh, it was a, it's a photo of David Epstein. Um, so what you do is you just, so each circle, you can take its center as a vertex, and then you join two circles that are that touch each other. And I guess in this case, because I said unit circles, the, all these lengths are equal to two, but you can also just pretend that they're all equal to one. So let's just forget about the circles for now. I'm interested in the graphs. So a graph like this is also known as a minimum distance graph of a set of points. This is how Adish actually introduced it. So in 1946, in his, it was quite a famous paper of his, uh, where he introduced the unit distance problem, the distinct distances problem, and there are also some other problems in there. One of them is to find the maximum number of edges of a minimum distance graph, or as I'm going to call it, a penny graph on n vertices. And he made two tiny contributions to this problem. It was clearly not the most interesting one of his problems, but still. So first of all, he mentioned it's there's an upper bound of three n minus six edges because it's a planar graph. And then he said there's also an upper bound of three n minus a constant times square root of n by more complicated arguments. But he didn't specify what they were. But I, I will recreate this later on. Okay. Um, so what is the correct? exact correct value, exact maximum number of edges given endpoints. Well, somebody, surname Reuter, uh, conjectured that the exact maximum is this value, three N minus some little square root term, and it's not an integer, so you round it down, and he conjectures that, that that's really the maximum. Um, this is the value that you get if you place the points on it on a triangular lattice. So you can start here in the middle and then start putting them in a spiral. That's one way to do it. And you, and you actually get this value. You can put this, these numbers into the online, no, yes, online encyclopedia of integer sequences. It's there. It's, it's one, of the, one of those um, known things. Um, 
Yeah, so this Reuter, he seems, I, I guess he was an amateur uh, mathematician or a school teacher, maybe, because he posed quite a lot of these problems in, in the Swiss journal Elemente der Mathematik, and this was one of them. And then Harbord, Heiko Harbord, proved it with a very nice induction argument. If you don't want to read German, it's, it's also in um, uh, the textbook Combinatorial Geometry of, of Janos and um, Pankaj Agarwal. Okay. Um, what about the extremal configurations? It's not so hard to look at Harbord's proof and see that the only way that you can really attain this value is on the triangular lattice. And this was shown first by Heitman and Radin. They are sort of people coming from mathematical physics. This, is, they, this was published in a physics journal. So they were interested in, in crystallization. So they interpreted this problem, maximum number of edges, as sort of minimizing a certain potential energy. And so this was in some sort of a crystallization result. Mm -hmm. And later on, Radin also generalized this for other types of uh, energy potentials. And there's, there's still some um, open problems there. So, so there's an applied direction. So if you, if you think that all of this is just recreational mathematics, no, it's not. If you, if you start thinking about it in terms of potential energy, then there's lots of problems here that's related to physics, but I will not look at any of them, sorry. Um, so I am more interested in, I will come to matchstick graph soon. Uh, so uh, yeah, another thing is uh, uh, Yakov Kupitz characterized uh, the extremal configurations. Uh, th this was independent, so it looks like he didn't know about um, Heitman and Radin. Okay, so that's the history of this problem. So what about matchstick graphs? So this was something that Harbord introduced. It was also because he was thinking of um, Adish's unit distance problem. So, he, so um, a matchstick graph is a, is a plane graph drawn with unit length straight line edges. Uh, as examples, all these penny graphs are matchstick graphs. But there are a lot more. You can do lots of funny things. Um, I mean, what 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 are the differences uh, between penny graphs and matchstick graphs? With a penny graph, you have uh, that the maximum degree is six. Uh, if I go back to this picture, it happens here. The vertex joined to six others, but with a penny graph, there's no no maximum degree. Because you can just start put, putting arbitrarily many matches. Theoretically, That's, of course. So, so, so this, is, it, is this a unit distances graph? Uh, or? It's, a, it's a unit distance graph with non-crossing edges. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That, just that. Um, so this this makes this problem sort of unphysical. But even if you assume something like that, there's, there's some minimum angle between them, then I don't know how to use that to prove anything about matchstick graphs. So they are strange things. But so the but first I have question about the definition of the this matchstick graph. If you have a um, two points that are exactly unit distance, but it would cause a crossing. You, what you just don't, it, it seems like it's undefined. I mean, how exactly to draw the graph? Uh, well, let's take a square with the, um, where the diagonal is distance one. Yeah. Then you can either do this or you can do this, but you can't, you can't have both. So, so it's, it's only def defined if you choose which, which edges you, you want to take. Uh, and is it defined up to isomorphism, or is it can can you um, make a choice and it leads to two different non-isomorphic uh, graphs? Um, I don't really care about isomorphism. Um, for me, it's it's really a geometric object. Yeah. It's a, some something there lying in the plane. Okay. Okay. So you just allow if if uh, 
So, so I would classify them up to isometry. Okay. Um, although late, later on you will see that there are some ones that are not rigid, so maybe maybe up to up to continuous deformations. Um, another question that that yeah. So let me continue about this question. Yeah. So one of his questions was, what's the smallest k regular matchstick graph? So regular graph just means all the vertices have the same degree. So that was that was sort of his first question. Um, he also asked, you know, what happens if there are no triangles? What's the largest number of edges? Just like what I discussed now with penny graphs. He also asked, what's the largest number of faces? But uh, once you use Euler's formula, this is basically the same question as the maximum number of edges. So I'm not going to think about that. Um, yeah, so graph is k regular if each vertex has degree exactly k. So it's a homework for you to find the smallest one regular and two regular matchstick graphs. So the first interesting case is the smallest three regular one. Actually, that's a nice puzzle, so maybe I shouldn't give it to you. Well, there it is. It has eight vertices. The smallest four regular one. Well, that's an open problem. So Arbot somehow, I don't know how, found this one. It has 52 vertices. It's he, he found it in 1986. It hasn't been improved since then. Maybe it is actually the smallest one, but I don't think there's any feasible way of, of, of searching. Not yet. Um, there's a lower bound of 34 vertices that was found by Sasha Kurtz. Um, yeah, so that is a, a strange problem. This uh, this graph, by the way, uh, people have looked at at finding co coordinates for it. You have to solve some polynomial of some funny degree, I think degree twenty two or something. So this is not this is not something that you can construct with ruler and compass. If if you find that interesting. Um, so what about a five regular graph? But so it, with the four regular graphs, is it, um, are there other four regular graphs that are known besides, you know, just make, taking copies of this? Yes, yes, there are lots of, lo lots, lots of, of them. Many of them um, were found by Winkler. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mike Winkler. Um, I, I will, later on, I will show some, some, uh, some of his results. Yes, so, so there are many that are known. I, th I think they try to construct them for all for all number of vertices. So it's known for 52 and then for some bigger number, not, not for 53. Well, no, you can't have for 50. Yeah, you could have. So yes, mm -hmm. um, there are some constructions. It's, there are some open problems around there. Um, five regular ones, well, who knows? It's possible to have five regular planar graphs. No, actually, it's not who knows. Um, so sort of soonish after Arbord asked this question, uh, Blocker has proved that the answer is no. There was some manuscript lying around. I don't know if people thought that something was wrong in the manuscript, uh, or maybe the manuscript also got lost. I don't know. but. It turned out, so later on, Sasha Kurtz uh, retyped the manuscript, corrected some errors, and it looks like it's, it's, the, the proof is valid. Um, you can find it on, on the archive. So Sasha Kurtz uploaded it on the archive. Nevertheless, there's a very short proof by Kurtz and, and Rampin Hasi that um, they, they gave a nice short proof using some sort of a charging argument. It's basically Euler's formula, and then you move around. You give charges to the vertices and faces, and move it, move charges around, based on geometry, based on on the angles that that you find. Um, so that's a, I don't know. It's it's a very nice combination of combinatorics and geometry. I I don't really understand why and how it works. 
Nevertheless, uh, what does this result say? It says that given a matchstick graph, there exists a vertex of degree not equal to five. That's sort of a very, it's equivalent to the fact that they don't exist, but stated in that way, it sounds very pessimistic. So how many vertices can you get of, the, the, of which the degree is not equal to five? Um, so this is one thing that Jeremy and I looked at. And basically by taking Kurtz and Pinchas's argument and adding the isoperimetric inequality, you can show that the number of vertices of degree less or equal to four in a matched graph is at least some constant time square root n. So the isoperimetric inequality comes from the fact that there must be lots of triangles in there and they all have an area, well, it's unit length triangles. So, so there's a lower bound to the area. So then there's an, um, a lower bound to the size of the boundary and that's on the boundary, you, you will find many um, vertices of small degree. Um, and this is the right order of magnitude. There are many sorts of examples. One of them is, you, you can, this is, I think this is called, a, this is an example of an Archimedean tiling or a semi-regular tiling. Around each vertex, you always get the same pattern of a square, triangle, square, triangle, triangle. And this thing has sort of translational symmetry, I don't know, something like, I'm not going to look for that now. So this thing is, is symmetric, you can extend it as big as you want. And then every vertex has degree five if you go off to infinity, but you have to find some finite piece out of it. And this is sort of a nice round piece. And so then you get not so many vertices of small degree. Here's another example. Uh, this was our original example in our paper, and then the referee told us, no, this is the right example. Well, it, it gives a better constant. So, but I, I still have no idea what the correct value is going to be, how to minimize that. Maybe this one is correct, because it's a nice triangular lattice. Okay. Um, so just going back to the number of edges. So recall that Harvard proved that the maximum number of edges in a penny graph is at most this value. And then 12 years later, he conjectured the same for a matchstick graph. Um, well, let's see what was known. Um, so, well, first of all, again, it's a planar graph, so it's at most three n minus six. You can get 3n minus a constant times square root n. I guess by that more complicated argument of Adish. So here's my conjecture what his complicated argument was. So I'm going to prove this upper bound. Uh, so you, first of all, without loss of generality, the graph is going to be connected. Otherwise, you can move disconnected pieces together and do something. You can also assume that it's too connected. Um, otherwise, you can take, you can decompose it into two connected pieces and then use induction somehow. So that's relatively simple. Um, now let's count the number of faces with um, like the number of triangles, F3, number of quadrilaterals, F4, number of pentagons, F5, and so on, and also the outer boundary length. Um, then if you do double counting, I don't know if you've seen this before. Should I explain this? Two times the number of edges is equal to three times the number of triangles plus four times the number of quadrilaterals and so on. Um, you don't have to believe me. Here's a proof. This is not completely too connected. It works in any case. So for each edge, I count I count each edge twice, once for, for the, for, there are two, there are two faces on both sides of an edge. And I end up counting all the edges twice. 
And the number of triangles is counted three times. The number of quadrilaterals is counted four times. This outer thing is also counted. And there's, of course, Euler's formula, which says that the vertices minus edges plus faces equals to two. But I don't count the unbounded one here, so it's one. Um, and then you just do some algebra and you get that the number of edges is equal to three N minus three minus B minus some sort of expression coming from this thing somehow. Um, so it's basically the number of non-triangular faces, but weighted. So I, a quadrilateral counts for one, pentagon counts for two and so on. So it's the number of diagonals inside, inside the, the face. And for this quantity, it will occur a lot in my talk. So I will just call it capital F. And now isoperimetric inequality comes in. So the first thing is the isoperimetric inequality tells us that the area of some region um, with the area A and perimeter B, so the area is less than B squared over four pi. And we also have a lower bound for the area, namely the number of triangles times their area. So we get that the we, we get an inequality between the number of triangles and B, the boundary length. So if there are lots of triangles, then the boundary is going to be big. So I subtract a lot here and I get this. On the other hand, if this is small, then most of this contribution is the non-quadrilateral uh, faces. And then because this is essentially E minus N, which is big, then I get that this is big. So again, I get uh, an, a bound like this. And then it's just a matter of, of, there are two cases, depending on whether there's a lot of triangles or not so much, and, and this is what you get. So that's basically, I think, Adish's more complicated argument. Okay. But we wanted to, to prove Harbord's conjecture. So one problem with that is that Harbord's proof breaks down. Harbord's proof is a very nice induction proof, um, but here it just doesn't work. His induction proof, a lot of it depends on the on angles. So in a penny graph, you get that all the angles are at least 60 degrees. In a in a matchstick graph, you don't get that. that. So that's basically, I think, the first problem you you encounter when you try to to use Arbor's proof. Um, yeah, there's no maximum degree. Um, so, but we proved it. But the proof is messy. So let's let's let me quickly go through the proof. So I think this is what um, Adam warned me against. I'll do it anyway. Well, so first, so it's 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 an induction proof. It so I consider a smallest counter example. It has too many edges. Again, by induction, you can get that that it's too connected. You can also prove that it has a minimum degree three. That's all very easy to do. Um, this will be important. The number of edges is three n minus three minus the boundary length minus that capital F, which will now play a big role in this proof. Um, so this inequality together with this gives us an upper bound on the, on the boundary. So the boundary is going to be small and Euler's formula will also give us a lower bound on the number of triangles. So of course we are going to use the isoperimetric inequality. But before we get there, um, we also need that this little f is not so small. Well, one thing, specific thing that we will need is, is, is that f cannot be equal to zero or one. If it's zero, then it means that there's the only bounded faces are triangles. So you can go and put it on a triangular lattice. And then it's a penny graph and it's an, this upper bound is known to work for penny graphs. If f is equal to one, well, then there's 
just the only way this can happen is that there's apart from the triangle triangular faces there's just one quadrilateral and then again you can go and chop up the the matchstick graph into pieces on the triangular letters use induction add up lots of stuff fight with square roots and find the, this upper bound so we can assume that it, uh, it's at least two and then we can use the isoperimetric inequality like before um, we get some sort of a bound and and when n is small also because of this rounding effect you actually get that it already works for small values of n just the isoperimetric inequality another thing that you that you also get is that f this f uh, must be some small constant times square root 12 n minus 3 because if we go back this isoperimetric thing gave us uh, 3n minus some constant times square root n it wasn't square root 12n something slightly smaller well if that is the correct value suddenly this looks wrong to me but never mind um It then follows that if f is too large, then that isoperimetric inequality, together with this f that you also subtract, give give you the gives you the theorem. Okay, so so far this is the easy stuff. Now the important thing is to look at the pieces of the matchstick graph, which has slightly too many edges. So there's going to be lots of triangles. So there's going to be lots of pieces that lie on the triangular lattice. And we call those maximal pieces lying on a triangular lattice, lattice components. Uh, let's say that there are K of them, G1 up to GK. We order them from largest to smallest. And then what can we say about them? Well, one thing is that their boundary lengths there's because everything lies on the lattice there's sort of a lattice isoperimetric inequality that you can prove it actually follows from this inequality for for points on the lattice on the triangular lattice but you get this lower bound for the boundary um another thing that you can show is that the triangular components they sort of pack the whole graph they cover almost everything uh, and Secondly, they they don't overlap too much. Um, how do you prove that? Well, like if you so for this left hand side one, if you if you take a vertex not not in not in the union of all of them, well, it has degree at least three. So this is going to be a non triangular face, non triangular face, non triangular face. So suddenly you get lots of non-triangular faces, but there's only this capital F of them. So if you do the counting correctly, you see that you, you get this error term on the lower side. On the upper side, uh, you look at vertices that lie in more than one triangular component. So let's say there's a triangular component. Here's another one. Here's another one. And it turns out that, well, the stuff in between cannot be triangular uh, triangles, but you, because otherwise they, they would glue these two triangular components together. So, so again, you find lots of non-triangular things. And if you count it correctly, you get this, this error term. Okay, so the sum of the NIs is basically N plus big O of square root of n. Another thing that you can show is that the largest lattice component is large, at least three quarters n. Actually, but at this stage, you can already, if you work hard, get that it's, it has to be at least 97% of everything, but we don't need that. It turns out we, we don't need that much. So how do we prove this? Well, if not, then they are all small. So there's at least two of them. And then if we estimate the sum of their boundary lengths, well, first of all, there's this lower bound. 
sum of square roots, square root function is concave, lots of ugly things. And then we get that it's sort of a large constant times square root 12 and minus three as a lower bound. On the other hand, you can easily upper bound this, this, this because each, each boundary edge of each component, so there's G1, somewhere there's G2. So if, if I look at a, a boundary edge, well, then either it is on really on the, on the outer boundary of the graph, um, or not. If it's not on the outer edge of the graph, then just beyond that edge, so here's a nice triangular thing, just on the other side, there must be a non-triangular face. So then again, by counting non-triangular faces, by counting it, stuff carefully enough, you get this. So you, and this you can bound by this. We already bounded this F before. So then we get some smaller constant times square root 12 and minus three. And together this gives a contradiction. So the largest lattice component is really large. Okay. Now we can cut this largest one out and, you, and so we subdivide the graph into two pieces. We have to, so there's, there's some uh, common boundary K. So these are all the vertices of the largest lattice component joined to something outside. So I also want those things to be part of the complement. I can bound the number of those vertices, again, in, in terms of F. Um, then I apply induction to both pieces. Again, some work. And I end up with this lower bound for F. So this is essentially a lower bound for F. So with the isoperimetric inequality, I found an upper bound. This is now a lower bound. And the next thing is to look at the boundary edges of G which is not on the boundary of G1. So this is this turns out that it's bounded by, well, by this expression. Well, this is basically because, um, what's another way of putting it? The boundary of G1 is either on the boundary of G, so it is, there are B boundary edges of G, B star is the ones not on there. So, so either you get this or um, it's not on the boundary of G. And then again, it means that in the neighborhood of that edge, there's a non-triangular face. And then somehow you can get this as an upper bound. You have to work a little bit uh, to get exactly one times F. It's, it's easy to get something like three times F something like that. So you, here we really need to use the geometry of the triangular lattice, but I don't want to get into that detail. Okay, but so now, uh, so remember, we, we already have uh, an upper bound for B, a lower bound for B1. So the upper bound for B was, um, it was this. We already had a lower bound also like that, or looking almost like that for B1. Putting all of this together, we get a very nice lower upper bound for these number of boundary edges, not on the boundary of the lattice, of the largest lattice component. It's nice because it also involves N1. So the bigger N1 becomes, the, the better this inequality becomes. So now we have some, well, so there's the boundary of G. Actually, there's a lot of edges on the boundary of, of G that, that belongs to G1, and they are all in lattice directions. So they maybe look like this. And then there are some others that, that are not like that. They have their own funny direction. But still, you now get a large part of the boundary which is in one of these directions. And so su suppose for the moment that B star is actually zero. So suppose that the whole boundary of G is on the lattice. 
So the boundary of G and G1 are the same. Well, what then happens is, well, now, now we can actually find a better isoperimetric inequality. So if I have a polygon and all the, all the edges are parallel to one of these six directions, which one gives me the best isoperimetric inequality? So if I, if I, if I take a, re a regular hexagon like this one, then its area, I, th I think you can go and calculate it like this. Eight square root three times the area is equal to B squared, where B is the, the perimeter of it. And it happens that this is the best case among all, among all polygons having edges parallel to this. So this is something, I guess, some people call it Lullier's inequality. So that the general problem is the following. I have some convex polygon Q, well, let's say a square. Question, which polygon with sides parallel to those of Q has the smallest boundary length? So for, for square, the question is which, which rectangle is optimal? And the answer to that is, of course, it's a square. Or I can take Q to be something like this. So, so now I also want to use a diagonal edge like this. So the question now is which, which polygon of this shape is going to be optimal? Have you ever heard of this problem before? Well, the answer turns out it's exactly the one where if you put an inscribed circle inside, it has to touch all the edges of the polygon. So, so that, that's how you have to position those directions. So that thing is, is, is called Lulia's inequality. Um, maybe it's in this paper of his, I, I looked at it, I don't understand what he wrote. It's, it's in some language, I, I think it, it was either Latin or French, um, so it doesn't help. However, there's a book of Feierstadt, which is called Lagerungen in der Ebene, blah, blah, blah. And Wonder of Wonders, a couple of days ago, Springer released an English translation of it. And Feierstadt discusses this inequality in quite, in quite some detail and, and prove, proves it and so on. So in our case, with a regular hexagon, it follows that the, 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 you always get this isoperimetric inequality. But what I, what I need is, is some sort of a variant, because if I go back to this problem, I do have some edges not parallel to one of these lattice directions. And so what we need is the following. So P is a polygon with perimeter B area A and for which the total length of the sides not parallel to any sides of some fixed hexagon, regular hexagon, is at most B star. So this is exactly the situation that we are in now. And then we just have this slight weakening of this inequality. There's just this extra term. So this is not tight. This constant here, it's something like 0.15 is not optimal. In fact, I have no idea what the optimal is. It looks like some sort of a tough isoperimetric problem to, to find exactly what is going to be the optimal figure. Um, yeah, I don't think it, it will be a polygon, but this is good enough for our purposes. So now if we redo that isoperimetric inequality argument, then we get this much better upper bound for F. Again, involving not just N, but also N1, the, the number of vertices in the biggest lattice component. Okay, so I guess my time is up. It's up no. to you. So thank you very much. No, no, no. Oh, sorry.
I, I'm not even finished with the proof. Then I um, missed um, what you said. Sorry? I misunderstood what you said then. You said your time is up? Yeah, I, well, I wondered if it's up. I think I still have a, a minute or something. No, 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 no. Um, at, at any rate, so by now you've seen lots of inequalities. We found this lower bound on F from cutting the biggest lattice component out. We found this upper bound from this variant of Lulier's inequality. Earlier on, I, I said you can show that this capital F is greater or equal to two. We also, I also explained sort of why the biggest lattice component is big. Now, if you put all these inequalities in a bottle and you shake it, and then what happens is boom, you get a contradiction. So yeah, it's basically, it's this together with these two opposing inequalities that forces F to be very small. In fact, to be one or zero, for which we already excluded. Yeah, so that is how we prove that the number of edges is at most what you get on a triangular lattice. It is messy. What is, what is, what is very weird is that if you look at all these um, inequalities, um, you would you would expect so these inequalities are not really tight. None of them are really tight. So you would expect that in the end you you prove it for sufficiently large n, but that's not what happens. If you do it carefully enough, you do it for all n, which is sort of nice. Okay, so let's think about some open problems. So let's forbid triangles. So here's a conjecture of mine. Um, it's actually from 2009. So, and it's about the pe penny graph. So now we are back to penny graphs. So I conjecture that the maximum number of edges is at most two n minus two square root n. And that's that's the number you get if you if you make a nice square grid. If you round down, well, then you can get away with stuff like this. That's not, not really nice. Um, again, you can find this sequence on the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. Um, there's some very strange things going on here. There's, there's some sort of a extreme non-rigidity. So not only is the square lattice not rigid, but you can do lots of modifications and, and still at, attain this value. Um, so I, I can remove those two vertices and three edges and put them here. Or I can remove that and I can sort of make a pentagon here. I can also do that. Um, there, there are worse examples where you don't, it's not on a square grid like this one. So long ago, so this was my first PhD student, Olof de Wet in South Africa. I gave him this problem. Um, he worked on it a little bit and he found this, this example. It doesn't, it looks like, uh, like five square lattices put together. It works, it, this one works, the smaller one also works. You, you get exactly this value, but if you want to extend it, if you want to make this example bigger, then it doesn't work anymore. So it looks like there are some small, strange counter examples, but still I think they, not, not counter examples. I couldn't find anything bigger than this, but I found lots that are not on the square grid. I mean, so maybe it's a good idea to just start with small examples and see what the things that can happen. Um, there's something like this or this. These are the best examples I could find. I tried to find all, all the extremal examples. So for each value of n, the one with a maximum number of edges. I don't claim that this is really the truth, what I drew, drew here. 
Yeah, some more. So you see here you get things that are sort of broken lattices, you could say. On the other hand, for certain values of n, like if n is a square, also what two times three, six, yes. For six, I could only find one example. One example, one example, one example, one example. So maybe for those values, which is either a square or a number times the next number, maybe you only get the square, uh, something lying on the square lattice. <clears throat> Combinatorially, because you, you can move these, these things, they, they are not rigid. Um, yeah, so what is known? Well, the Euler formula gives you an upper bound of 2n minus 4. Any planar graph without triangles has at most 2n minus 4 edges. Um, David Epstein looked at the, worked on this problem and he found an upper bound 2n minus a constant times square root n. And this is essentially this isoperimetric idea. So what you get is that each face has area at least twice the area of an equilateral triangle. So the the worst quadrilateral is like this. So then you can use the isoperimetric inequality. But this is the best known. So there's an open problem. Another thing that, that he proved, and, that, and so I'm, I want to go to matchstick graphs now, is he proved that there's always a vertex of degree at most two in these graphs in triangle-free penny graphs. So you can ask, does the same thing happen with matchstick graphs? Harbord already asked this question. Um, so here's an example that Harbord gave of a three regular triangle-free matchstick graph on 30 vertices. The optimal one has 20 vertices. So that has been found by Quirtz and Matsuokolo. Um, and then you can also, well, so the smallest one is known. So what about not just forbidding triangles, but also forbidding quadrilaterals? So in other words, if you assume that the girth of the matchstick graph is at least five, does, are there three regular ones? The answer is yes. So Mike Winkler found this one which has 54 vertices. This is the smallest one known. You're welcome to find smaller ones. Girth six is, is impossible, thanks to the Euler formula. You, you can make an, an, an infinite one of girth six with the hexagonal backing. Again, let's go back to this question of what's the largest number of edges. This is my favorite question. But now in a triangle free match stick graph. So again, we know it's at most 2n minus 4. What about 2n minus a constant square root n? I don't know. So there's no obvious lower bound for, for, for the area. Um, so if you have a quadrilateral, it, it can be arbitrarily flat. And the, the best example that I have is this one. So you can draw a flower like this for any, this is an octagon. You can take any even number of K, draw something like this. Um, you get about half K squared vertices, about K squared edges. So you get something like two N minus square root two N which is a bit bigger than what than, than the square grid, which was 2n minus 2 square root n. But again, I, I have no idea whether this would be an, an optimal one. So I, so I just um, like end with this as a problem. I, I don't even have a conjecture here. So that's it, now, now I'm done.